You are on the Frenzy Feed. The, the Professor, Professor Frenzy, Frenzy Show! Professor Frenzy, it's a show. Professor Frenzy Show. Professor Frenzy, it's a show. Professor Frenzy Show. Hello. Welcome to the Professor Frenzy Show, episode 317. My name is Jerry. And I'm Chris. And we are your hosts. On the Professor Frenzy Show, we are going to try to spotlight some smaller publishers' comics that we think deserve some attention. We aren't going to rate or score comics. We really aren't going to be reviewing comics. We're just going to talk about some that we think people should consider reading. So, Chris, did you read any good comics this week? Uh, yes, Professor, as a matter of fact, I sure did. Thanks, Prof. Wow, that was awesome. Yeah, it sure was awesome. Prof, what an interesting week, because there was just a huge amount of weeks a couple of weeks ago, but this past week, mm -hmm. not so much not so in much. the indie side. What yeah. a surprise, what a surprise. And both of us, surprise, surprise, looked at the three <laughs> same books. Yep. I have a couple of leftovers from last week that I'll hold on to for now, but we both looked at three mutual reads and surprise, surprise, I didn't expect to see this on yeah. the stands. Saga, number 67 from Image <laughs> Comics came out this past week, written by Brian K. Vaughn, art done by Fiona Staples, priced at $3.99. Mm -hmm. Professor, please take the floor and we'll pick it apart. You betcha. So welcome back, Saga. Again, it seems like Saga disappears and then comes back when it wants to. So uh, now Alana, Hazel, and Robot Jr., or Squire, are in a circus-themed spaceship. So Hazel, who's got her wings out, is a backstage helper. Uh, and Alana is in change of clown shenanigans, a job that she performs with very strict gusto. She is in charge of these clowns. She has a gun that makes its victims realize, uh, relive the saddest moments of their lives, which is kind of entertaining. Um, and she gets asked out on a date by the, I think it's a, either a bartender or the chef. And she's kind of stunned because she hasn't really dated anyone in a while. Says no, but, you know, he, they stay friends and maybe we'll see what happens later. Um, so we also see the will by his pool and he's clearly struggling with depression. He lost his girl and he also has a hook on his right hand. So he gets a lead on where Alana is, but he doesn't care. He's just in depression mode. Uh, he sees, uh, Gwen who's also struggling with the loss and she's also seeing the daughter and people from their past. So uh, Squire, or Robot Jr., who can now speak, is spending a lot of time with his holodeck helmet. And Hazel calls him an emo. He's kind of uh, disconnecting from people a little bit. Uh, Hazel walks through the ship and hears some music and follows it. And she goes into a room and finds a wild-looking kind of guitar keyboard thing and goes, reaches out to play it, but is interrupted by someone who will be a force in her life in the future. So uh, first off, the elephant in the room is that there's too much time between these arcs and so in Saga. I'm really, it's hard to stay connected with these characters when it's months and months and months between them repeatedly. Now, also if past arcs are predictive of the future, uh, none of the arcs really add up to a whole heck of a lot. Um, it's just some characters and, you know, remember Bombazine from all those years ago? Yeah, me neither. Um... I like the idea of a circus spaceship. Uh, we also know that in the past, Hazel has learned to play music. So maybe that was, you know, the takeaway from that story arc. Um, and uh, so maybe it is going to be related to what's going to happen in the circus, some kind of musical thing. Um, this new person, a uh, person, a uh, creature in her life uh, is, you know, obviously a musician. So maybe there's something, maybe she, there's going to be a band and she's going to be a rock star. Who knows? I like the setting. I like the characters. But in this issue, I don't really see a conflict that's looming. Whereas in other arcs, there has been a conflict. I don't see what it is here. So I'm wondering where we're going. Uh, it's nice enough to have these characters and storyline back. Um, but, uh, you know, let's see what happens here. Uh, Chris, what did you think about saga number 67? Thanks, Professor. I thought you summed it up beautifully well. I'll just be a little more brief than you. It's hard for me to judge this book because I, I don't have the sum of all its parts. I'm just looking at one little bit of the thing and I'm just judging it for the issue in and of itself. And for that, it was beautifully written. It was beautifully illustrated. 
that said, I I think I've read easily a hundred plus books <laughs> mm-hmm. in the time I've last read an issue of Saga. So it, it was hard for me to pick up where, where this left off. And I had no idea where I was when, when this started or where it ended. Mm-hmm. And, and as much as that, I, I thought it was a fine, fine issue in and of itself, but more so I was lost with the overall big picture. Mm-hmm. I, I felt the plight, but beyond that, I, I really need Saga to come on and, out on a more consistent basis. And I know I'll take what I can get based on the creator's timetable and wanting to do what they can to produce their best story and best efforts. But I just was a little lost. I thought it was a great issue, but Mm -hmm. I kind of was not sure where it was going. Yep. Yeah. I agree. (laughs) (laughs) Or where it was coming from. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Still love the book. Still love the book. Don't yeah, get me wrong. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, yeah, I am definitely picking up the next issue, 68, but a um, scr- little head scratching. Indeed. Our thoughts and impressions on Saga. This was issue number 67 from Image Comics, priced at $3.99, and a book for mature readers. Mm-hmm. Well, next up, we have a couple of conclusions. We'll start with Judgment Day number three of three from Archie Comics, written by Aubrey Sitterson, are done by Megan Hutchinson, colors done by Matt Herms, letters done by Jack Morley, priced at four ninety nine. Professor, I will let you take the floor, describe the contents, and then we'll see if we thought this stuck the landing. All right. So Madam Satan has bonded Archie to a demon, Alistair, so that he they can fight the nasty creatures that are possessing uh, Archie's friends and messing up Riverdale. But it turns out it was all a trap. So Madam Satan could control Archie. Archie's killing his friends who are possessed. Jughead urges him to stop, but he doesn't. Alistair is too strong. And at the end, Madam Satan has her new lover. Uh, Okay. Uh, I've been complaining about this book since issue one, and I thought, "Ah, maybe it's going to get better. Maybe it's going to pull it together. I never really felt that it pulled it together. Um, This issue is mostly a fight. Um... Archie and Alistair is fighting a demonic, I think, Betty and Veronica, and Jughead is whining about it. Um, I just I, I just never got a real handle on what was happening and why I should care about it, other than I like Archie and Jughead and Betty and Veronica. Um, I think the best part of the book uh, was the cover by Francisco uh, Franco Villa. Um, I just wish that these Archie comics, these horror comics, were would get back to the fantastic vibe they had just a couple of years ago. Um, it seems like they've kind of lost their way a little bit, in turn, it, as far as I think, anyway. Uh, Chris, I'd love to hear what you thought about Judgment Day number three. Thanks, Prof. Wow. Um, you bring up some interesting points, and... I'll get there in a second for clarification too. There were some other covers done. One was done by Megan Hutchinson. You had the Francisco Francovella cover. One was also done by Rico Murray Kami. And there was also one done by Luana Vecchio. Wow. Four covers. Holy cow. I remember yeah. back in the day we, we just had two and we were satisfied with that enough with the variants. My gosh. Yep. Um, I think I liked it a little better than you, but I think what elevated it for me was Megan Hutchinson's artwork. I think she really elevated this to how creepy can I make this book? How unsettling can I make this book? How daring can I make this book? And Gauntlet Throne, she answered the bell. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pay attention to Megan Hutchinson going forward with what she's going to be doing with respect to any of our work. And I, I, I think this couldn't be topped. This was an ugly book. It was a grotesque book. It was a nasty book. This was a book that did not have a happy ending. So if you're a hardcore <laughs> RG fan wanting wanting the dust to clear and happiness in Riverdale going forward, you will not find it here. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying not to spoil it, but my gosh, uh, the fate that befells our beloved Archie characters is bad. And it that's where it ends. I didn't think I would see Betty and Veronica possessed in such a grotesque manner and mm. Archie doing this one thing and poor Jughead resigned to the faith that, you know, he's doing everything he can to get things back on track, but it does not work out. Mm. Um, there were some gorgeous double page spreads here. There were some nice splash pages throughout the series of my opinion. I don't know where I'd rank it with respect to the Archie titles. Obviously you were not a fan of this. I think I liked it a little bit better than you. I thought it was a little bit daring not to have a quote unquote happy ending in an Archie comic with, with the fate of Riverdale as it was. But that said, was it a well-told story? It was it was okay, but I think what I liked a little bit more and what brought me in more was just to see 
Hutchinson's artwork. And if she did something in the previous issue, she seemed to successively top herself a little bit. And I, that's what I came in, came in for, I think, more so with this finale. Did it stick the landing for me? I will say I was surprised by the ending. I didn't see it coming. Uh, did I like it? I don't know, but it was something that was daring that I dare say may not have occurred in an Archie horror comic book before. So for that, I guess I applaud it for the originality. Um, did it meander a bit? Absolutely. Did I like the Alistair character? Mm, not really, but I do like that there was some allusion to a previous Archie character, but I keep circling back. It's Hutchinson's artwork that kept me really elevating this above the material in and of itself. I think she, you know, was handed a script. Okay, what what can you do with this? And wow, look look what was turned in as the result. So for the in as much as that, um, I think it's somewhere in the middle. Not not, not I, I don't find it as sort of the worst Archie horror I've ever read. Maybe not the best, but I think uh, Hutchinson's artwork elevated it to another level that made me come and appreciate it for that. That makes sense. Okay. Anything else? Uh, no, just uh, you're you're right about the art. Um, the the art is pretty, um, very interesting and and well done. So uh, we'll keep an eye out for Megan Hutchinson in the future. Indeed, Archie Comics Judgment Day three of three from Archie Comics, priced at four ninety nine. A book for a teen plus audience, but boy, you better yeah. you teens be careful there because I thought <laughs> this was like a mature thing. But in and of itself, they say it's a teen plus book, so we'll say it's a teen plus book. And look at this. We are up at Ghost Lord number 12. Yeah. Wow. From Boom Studios, written by Cullen Bunn, art done by Liam Max, colors done by Jason Wordy, letters done by Ed Dukeshire. $4.99 was the price point. Professor, here's where it settles. What happens here? All right. Well, the spirits of the dead are everywhere. Harmony and her dad, Lucas, are ready to hear their stories to make them rest, but there are so many of them. Now, Shane is in the graveyard spoiling for a fight, and he's unleashing the dead upon the world. So they all get together and have a good old-fashioned comic book fight. Uh, Harmony realizes that her dad is a fighter, but she's a listener, and so that they're different in that way. So she fills Shane's head with all the stories she's heard, and it stops him, and her dad finishes him off. So that's a big spoiler, but uh, Harmony realizes that she needs to listen to everyone's stories so that they can pass on to the next world. She's going to be like a shepherd, so she is able to sacrifice herself to allow the spirits to move on, and her father can return to his church. So, you know, I realized that as I was writing the recap that it doesn't really capture how satisfying this was for me. Um, there's a kind of a quote unquote post credit scene with Harmony lining up all the dead to listen to their stories where she says, one at a time, everyone, we've got forever. And that's literally forever. Uh, I love her sacrifice. I love how she takes on the mantle of the shepherd. And overall, I, you know, looking back, I really liked ghost lore. It was slow in, paces, in places, and sometimes it had some confusing bits and erratic bits, but the relationships, particularly between Harmony and her dad, and, the conne and their connection really made it work for me, and this whole sacrifice, um, the way it ended up at the end, and how they got together to defeat Shane using their own strengths, um, what, what really worked for me. Um, thank you, Colin Bond, for, I'm going to miss this book um, when it's gone, and, you know, I kind of really didn't realize that until the past couple of issues, how much really I, I really enjoyed this. Uh, Chris, I'd love to hear what you thought about Ghost Lore number 12. I didn't expect this to be on the shelf this past week, and mm. I found it to be a pleasant surprise. I found it to stick the landing. I was a little saddened with the way it ended in as much as that, oh, I thought the father would make the greater sacrifice and not the mm. daughter. It, it thought the roles would reverse. And I kind of questioned myself if if the story had taken a twist like that, how could it have ended? Mm -hmm. But then I, I think it rings true to the characters with respect to the harmony, being the listener, being the more empathetic one, being a little more in tune with herself than perhaps her father was, mm -hmm. who, who is this you know religious figure that people come to see and hear. I liked one element that Cullen Bove weaved in this story was, as we were wrapping up towards the conclusion, we got to see little snippets of the prior characters who shared their story in these one-off panels. And at first, I didn't recognize the context of the story because here we are at issue 12, and it was hard for me to remember everybody who's had their story 
told in a sense up until we had the woman who takes her camera to the funerals and I go, oh, look what he's doing. He's showing us all these past characters and where they where they landed with respect to that. Uh, I thought it was beautifully illustrated. I like the sepia tones that we got where we see Harmony in her netherworld, if you will, in the afterlife. I thought it was a beautiful thing. And I thought this ending did stick the landing for me. It posed some questions for me as to how the characters felt, how the characters acted and how they resonated with me. And that's good storytelling when Mm -hmm. a writer can do that for me. And Liam X with his artwork and putting that all together was very, very superior with the storytelling. I want to give a shout out to Jason Wordy who did the colors because I thought the sepia tones were really, really beautiful. There was a lot of palettes going on in here. Shout out to the colorists with respect to that. Um, Now here's my other quandary. I don't know. I, I think this will be in the conversation for my personal best of mm-hmm. 2024. That said, out of a list of 10 books where we have so many good books, I don't know if it's going to make my top 10, but does it have to? I don't know. Mm. But that said, I, I want this. I think this book does need to find an audience if you are a horror fan. And I think it will be uh, 12 issues is a perfect book for trade, you yeah. know, with respect to that. So if, if somebody, you know, this wasn't on their radar, I think this book does need a little bit of somebody to get on a soapbox and say, Hey, ghost lore was a really, really good book. And if you're into horror, I think you would appreciate it. Yeah. That said, I, I want in as much as that, this is what we're here for. And that's the drive of our podcast is to kind of put a spotlight in some of these other comics that aren't getting a lot of love and attention. And I think ghost lore certainly deserves that. Will it be in my best of top 10? Maybe, maybe not, but that said, it's still a solid comic, and I sure got my money's worth with respect to the storytelling and the art. This was a fine horror limited series. I truly enjoyed it. Yeah, it's interesting you put it that way. I I kind of feel that there were some really great issues, but overall, like, you know, I'd give each, a lot of the issues like a B plus, A minus. They were, they were good, Um, but it's really, as you step back and look at the story and characters as a whole, that I think this story really, really works. Um, and it's not really till the end here that as I'm, you know, thinking back on where we came from and all the things we did, how good this book was. So, um, I agree. This is one ghost lore. If you, you know, when this comes out in trade, I think a horror fan should check it out. I think it's, it's, it's better, you know, you might pick up a book and flip through it and go, I don't know, maybe this is good. Maybe it isn't. The effect of reading the whole book is excellent. And I think you'll really enjoy it. Yep, our thoughts and impressions on Ghost Lore. This was the final issue, number 12, from Boom Studios, priced at $4.99 and a book for eighteen thirteen plus audience. Yeah, so Chris, what other books did you read either this week or last week? <laughs> Thanks, Prof. <laughs> I had a couple of leftovers from last week. It was so big, I, I just couldn't get to everything on the show. But I did want to mention a couple of things I did look at that I did enjoy. Uh, Blow Away, which I thought was the final issue, was actually up to issue number four. Now, this was written by Zach Thompson, illustrated by Nicola Izzo, uh, from Boom Studios priced at $4.99. Real quick, in this Arctic murder mystery, we last left Bryn falling through a crevasse. Now, via a flashback, we see that Bryn used to hold an investigative job, and she had the story that she was going to take and run with it that her superiors told her to kill, and she was sort of bribed off. But she published it anyway, and the perpetrator came back to confront Bryn on it and committed suicide in front of her. Wow. Now, we've Smash cut back to the present. Brooke finds herself at the bottom of this crevasse. A masked man wearing winter gear helps Bryn. He feeds her and he clothes her, but Bryn doesn't trust him. And he seems to let on through some verbal clues that there's more to this guy that meets the eye that Bryn had not revealed. Bryn escapes to a cabin where she radios for help, but then she blacks out. One of her foot is severely frostbitten. She wakes in in a hospital and the sheriff tells her that there's footage that actually Nick is alive and not Andrew, not the other way around. Bryn thinks, okay, there's a murderer on tape and he's lying to be concluded. Really, really enjoying the series. I like the twists and turns throughout on this. I think I'm going to have to give it a little bit more of a reread because I think there are some little pieces of the puzzle that are missing. This issue moved pretty fast. And for a penultimate issue, it did in on a pretty cool cliffhanger. My thoughts and impressions on Blow Away, number four from Boom Studios, priced at $4.99 and a book for 18, 13 plus audience. Great. And real quick, Uncanny Valley, number four from Boom Studios, written by Tony Fleeks, are done by Dave Walker, priced at $4.99. Uh, just in summary, real short, Oliver's mom is alive and she comes to save the day from the cartoon Big Bads. And we get to see a little bit of a cool origin story 
with Peg. And it was really nice to see her as a little girl and the interactions that she had. We smash cut to her early adulthood and the twists and turns that her life took via a flashback. Now, after that, the big bad throws Oliver's grandfather out into the horizon to be continued. I'm really enjoying Uncanny Valley with all of its weird and unique cartoon characters mixing in and blending in with the real world. It is not going at the pace I thought it would go to, but I really was glad that we got to see some of the background for Oliver's mom in this one. Uncanny Valley, number four from Boom Studios, priced at $4.99. I didn't see an immediate rating on this, but I'd probably say this is a book for a teen audience. Great. And today is Wednesday. What books are you looking for this week, Chris? Thanks, Prof. We got Gotcha Man number two from Mad Cave Studios, written by the aforementioned Cullen Bunn, art done by Chris Batista. It's four ninety nine. dollars Red Before Black, number one from Boom Studios, written by Stephanie Phillips, art done by Goran Suzuka. It's four ninety nine. dollars Scarlet number three from Image Comics is out today, written by Kelly Thompson, art done by Marco Ferrari and Lee Lawfridge. It's three ninety nine. dollars American Horror, The Terror at the End of Time from Dark Horse Comics is out today, written by Cullen Bunn, art done by Andrea Moody. Three ninety nine dollars is the price point. Prodigy Slaves of Mars from Dark Horse is out today, written by Mark Miller, art done by Stefano Landini. It's four ninety nine. dollars But hang on, mm. before you get going, Prof, what else is out today? We've got Public Domain, number seven from Image, written by Chip Zdarsky, with art by Chip Zdarsky, and that's $3.99. The Deviant, number seven from Image, written by James Tynan IV, with art by Joshua Hickson, and that's $3.99. Cruel Universe, number one, another one of these EC comics from Oni Press, written by Karina Bechko, with art by Kano, and that's $4.99. And we've got a couple of these Image First books. We're going to see Bitter Root number one, excellent book from Image, written by David Walker and Chuck Brown, with art by Sanford Green, and that's one dollar from Image. Uh, also, another Image First, Isola number one from Image, written by Brendan Fletcher and Carl Kershaw, with art by Carl Kershaw and M. Sassy K, and that's a dollar. We haven't said M. Sassy K on the show for a while. And then finally, the Image First Rat Queens, number one from Image, written by Curtis J. Weeb with art by Rock Upchurch. And that's a dollar. What do you think about this week's books, Chris? Thanks, Prof. I saw a house ad for Red Before Black in the aforementioned Boom Studios book, and it looks really intriguing. So I'm uh, wondering what Stephanie Phillips is up her sleeve with that. A second issue of Gotcha Man. We'll see what's going on there. I'm really, really enjoying the Scarlet miniseries from Image Comics, mm-hmm. run by Telly Thompson, and the artwork done by Marco Ferrari. I, I'm, I'm all in for the heist. The Deviant. I wonder how far uh, Tynan the Fourth. Thank you for Professor Allen is going to push the narrative because I just don't know how many backstory we can get without it kind of giving us a smash cut to the present. And of course, we've got that uh, EC Oni Cruel Universe. Mm. I was kind of a little down on the horror. I'm hoping the sci-fi one won't let me down. So I'm really curious to see what the contents lie within. Prof, Mm -hmm. what are your thoughts and impressions? Well, some of these image first looks good. Uh, Bitter Root, great, great story about racism and um, demon fighting in Harlem and various places around the country. Great book. Isola, beautiful, beautiful book. And uh, Rat Queens, hysterical. Um, but And also hoping that uh, Cruel Universe is a little better than the uh, first EC horror uh, attempt. And always digging uh, the Deviant, um, seeing where that ends up. I am kind of fascinated by this Arkham Horror idea, this uh, story by Cullen Bunn. So we'll see how that goes. So next week, there's a lot of promise next week. We'll see how it goes. So those are the comics out this week. But let's go back to the past for a great classic comic book. It's time for Chris's Comics Corner. Chris's Comics Corner. So, Chris, what classic comic book are you going to look at today? Thanks, Prof. What if I gave you a book illustrated by Marshall Rogers, but it wasn't a Batman comic? What if I gave you a book that was a Doctor Strange story primarily, but it wasn't in the title Doctor Strange? What if I gave you a book that also had a Captain America story, but the book wasn't itself in the Captain America title? So for that, today I... Go take the Wayback Machine to Marvel Fanfare number five, which was cover dated November 1982 and cover priced at $1.25. Our first story is To Steal the Sorcerer's Soul. It was written by Chris Claremont, art done by Marshall Rogers and Craig Russell with a gorgeous wraparound cover. You couldn't beat that. Holy cow. 
our story opens with Doctor Strange looming outside a Sanctum Notorium, looking out that unique window with a familiar symbol on it and saying, I sense something is amiss as he talks to Klee. And Klee says, well, forget about it, Doctor Strange. Whatever it is, I'm sure you can handle it. Let's go to bed, Stephen. Come on. Just as he goes to bed, we see a little girl running through traffic. She's possessed and she's knocking on Doctor Strange's door at four in the morning, which sort of ticks off the doctor who puts on his bathrobe and he comes to answer the door. It's a girl. She's possessed. What's going on here? Well, Stephen has to get to the bottom of it, but it's a ruse, you see. She's merely bait to distract Stephen from the villain Nicodemus. Uh Uh-huh. Nicodemus is going to infiltrate Strange's mind while Strange is occupied elsewhere. Nicodemus is invading the Sanctum Sanctorium with the little girl. She manages to knock out Wong. Meanwhile, Klee senses something amiss, and she's going to investigate on her own. She does find that Nicodemus has invaded the Sanctum Sanctorium, but Nicodemus puts a spell on her. Meanwhile, we get to see in the nether region a confrontation with Doctor Strange and Dharamu, the classic villain from way back in the day for Doctor Strange, but it's an all's well that ends well ending, as only Doctor Strange can pull off. He takes care of everybody, returns Wong back to himself, returns the little girl back to herself, and what about Nicodemus the villain? Well, Doctor Strange surmises he will remember my experience has countered the advantage he had in raw power. In the end, I think it may have overcome him, but with that, I had to defeat him and himself. And Klee says, well, you kind of showed this guy a little bit mercy. I don't understand, Stephen. Why? Why did you let up on the guy? And I love the way the story ends. To quote Doctor Strange, he was not evil, merely ill. His soul was twisted, warped by his psychotic lust for power. Remember, Klee, Doctor Strange is more than a simple magician. I am also, in many ways, primarily a healer. I wanted to cure Nicodemus by showing him the true price and folly of success. No man can attain the power I possess without first gaining the wisdom and maturity to control it, lest that self same power destroy him from within. Now his soul is free, purged of its madness. Hopefully, when he recovers, this psychic cleansing will enable him to live a full, normal, productive life. And Cleese says, oh, Stephen, thank you. And Stephen says, hmm, for what? And Cleese says, for having grown into the man you are, a good man, a gentle, caring man, a healer of the spirit, as much as you were once the healer of the body. But for most of all, being the man I love. Oh, I love the conclusion to that. And we're not done. (laughs) This issue also (laughs) gives us a Captain America story titled Shall Freedom Ring, written by Roger McKenzie and Luke McDonnell, who did the plot and the script. Luke McDonnell with the pencils, John Beatty with the inks. And our story goes as follows. We immediately go to a flashback of World War II. Our eyes are not playing tricks on us. It's Cap and Bucky infiltrating the Blackmore Asylum, where there's a legion of Nazis, including one guy who's got a robotic suit. But Captain America takes him out, and that's his downfall. Now, throwing in the shield with the robotic suit is a man named Stryker. The suit is double-charged, and unfortunately, Stryker passes away. Guess what? Stryker has a son who wants to exact revenge back in the present. He studies Captain America, and he decides, I'm going to exact my revenge on Captain America all of these years later by studying film and capturing him and making him a public disgrace. Stryker poses as a museum curator, and he invites Captain America to a special showing in Arlington, Virginia, at a War Memorial Museum. As Cap walks through the display, he's gratified seeing all of these fantastic figures of your being depicted, the statues of Lincoln and Abe Lincoln and General MacArthur, and much, much more. But Cap is horrified when he sees a statue of Captain America holding a Nazi flag. He's shocked. And Stryker then reveals himself. He's not the curator. He's exacting his revenge. All of a sudden, the statues of General MacArthur, Abe Lincoln, and all of these heroes from the past, the Doughboys, what have you, come to life, and they overpower Captain America with chloroform. Captain America comes to, and he finds that he's dressed in Nazi garb, and that Stryker himself has taken on his costume. Captain America breaks free. There's a violent, violent, and vicious fight. But during the battle that is raged, the statue falls over, and it pierces the back of Stryker himself. Captain America muses. Well, he couldn't be reached in time to help, and he only found death. 
A shame as it is, he threw away his life for nothing, and Captain America muses to himself a costume, a shield, or even a flag. These symbols, which represent freedom, can always be destroyed, but freedom itself endures forever. Wow. All of this for a mere $1.25. I was blown away as a kid when I got this. Now, this was a specialty comic book back in the day. In other words, you could only find it in the specialty shops. This wasn't a book you would readily find at your local 7-Eleven until later on because Marvel wanted to experiment as a direct-only book. And as such, this was a little bit tougher to find. But boy, your $1.25 was not wasted on respect to the gorgeous artwork, the luxurious then Baxter paper that you got, uh, the high glosser stuff. And I really, really was taken aback because the stories were a little more sophisticated, a little more adult. But my gosh, the Marshall Rogers artwork and the Captain, or pardon me, the Doctor Strange story was really, really magnificent. Of course, I had known him from the Detective Comics run that he did back in the late 70s. But it was so cool to see him, Doctor Strange, and the really cool dimensions and the sound effects that he did with this. And just the compassion that he had paired with Chris Claremont's writing was really, really in a treat in of itself. And if that wasn't enough, a really cool Captain an America story, in my opinion, that I thought by Roger McKenzie. And I thought this was really, really cool with Luke McDonald's pencils. They're really, really good team up. And it really gives some thoughts and provokings with some of the things that the characters were going through in their mindsets. Yes, it gave us some great action and adventure, but it also gave us how the characters thought and felt. And for that, <laughs> Marvel Fanfare number five from way back in 1982 is my classic comic this week. Awesome. So Marvel Fanfare number five is in this week's Chris's Comics Corner. Chris's Comics Corner. All right. So last week, last night for Chris and I, Spanguli showed Cult of the Cobra. What'd you think, Chris? A good cast. And I have to yeah. really applaud it there. There was some nice familiar faces. Now, David Jansen was, uh, you, you know, the fugitive, but that was mm -hmm. a little before my time. I knew him from a show called Harry O as a oh, detective yeah. cop show back in the day. And it was really cool to see them. Of course, we saw Richard Long, who we've seen in the Twilight Zone. And of course, he was from Nanny and the Professor in the Big Valley. So he, you know, had a nice little role here with respect to that. House on Haunted what, Hill. Yes. Thank you. House on Haunted Hill. I knew I was forgetting something. Thanks, Prof. And I think... You know what was really unique? A lot of the guys in this movie hum. I mean, when they're walking mm. somewhere or doing something, they're kind of either whistling a tune <laughs> as they're going to a door, as they're going from place to place, as they're little, little things. What occupies their mind is a lot of people hum. And I, mm. I don't remember, I don't see a lot of guys hum these days, but back then, you know, I guess people <laughs> hummed while they did whatever they needed to do. Uh, Faith Demaru, I thought was really, really good in this. I thought she yeah. was really, really effective. I thought she could, you know, could have played possibly a Selena Kyle or a Lois Lane back in the day if, in a somatic bit, because I think, I think she had a striking presence there. This was a little bit of a B movie feel to it, but I, I liked it for what it was. I thought there were some unique moments to this movie. I thought some bits were a little hokey with the little fishbowl effect when the snake attacks a guy. And I, I thought, <laughs> how come these guys can't seemingly get away? But here we are. Prof, I've, I'll let you take the floor because there might be a thought you have out there that I might want to circle back to. Yeah, well, I, I thought, like you said, I thought this was a good movie. Um, I was expecting garbage, <laughs> to be honest with you. But uh, no, I thought this was solid all the way through. It, it made sense. The characters had relationships with each other that were believable and worked. And um, I, I don't think it was a great, great movie. And you, you mentioned it has kind of a B-movie feel. And I think uh, I definitely picked up on that. And it also kind of seemed to me to be kind of like especially with the the cobra woman to kind of treat her like they treated um the woman in cat people and it seemed to be that there was a lot of kind of similarities between this and cat people but cat people was better it was eerier and definitely a, a cooler vibe but this was a very good straightforward uh story with a bunch of uh, american gis getting themselves in trouble uh somewhere in asia uh, i'm not sure exactly where but but uh, i thought it was a good movie I did too, and it was really cool to see a young Richard Long and a young uh, David Jansen. Uh, the lead guy was Marshall Thompson, and I thought it was so weird because, you know, some of the other Lester characters went on to have longer, 
well, careers, what have you, or mm -hmm. appeared more often in, in my limited scope of TV and movie viewing. And Thompson, Marshall Thompson looked familiar to me, and I, I wondered where I couldn't place him. Now, he was in a movie called Clarence the Cross-Eyed Lion, which later became a show called Dactari. And, uh, Prof, I don't know if you ever saw the show Dactari. Uh, it was, when I was a kid, it didn't get rerun that much. And I only saw maybe a couple of seasons of it. Uh, when I lived in Wisconsin, a, a station out of the Twin Cities briefly reran it, mm -hmm. maybe for a summer, and that's the only exposure I had to Dictari, which was like some type of jungle series. Prof, do you have any recollection of Marshall Thompson or or the TV series Dictari at all? Uh, not Dictari. I, I I remember commercials, so that may I may have picked him up off of the commercials. I think he was also in Fiend Without a Face. I ah, think okay. that was, and because I felt the same way. It's like, who is this guy? I feel yeah. like he played somebody, I don't know, um, somebody big in a show that I love, but uh, I never watched Doc Tari. So I'm, I'm just kind of going down his IMDb and I'm not seeing where else I might've seen him. Just Fiend Without a Face. That's, that's pretty much all I can think of. So yeah. who knows? Mm-hmm. But good, he he was good. I believed him. He was kind of a little bit of a one thing that I found a little uh, interesting was just uh, the dating mores in movies set in the time that you know they meet each other and they immediately love each other, and uh, you know, <laughs> well, good luck with that. But I definitely enjoyed it. I did too. It had a nice little feel to it. I like how there was the camaraderie, the the chumminess that we had with yeah. the, the, the 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 guys with respect to that. I, I like how they got on with their lives. You know, where we had Jansen running the bowling alley and everybody mm -hmm. else in the career. There, you know, they more or less kind of had each other's back. You know, as you know, from what they went through. So, I, in a sense, I like that. Uh, I liked the look of the movie. I don't know if that mm -hmm. makes any sense. I don't know if the fishbowl thing worked for you, Prof. But for in as much as we have and the effects that they had with the budget. Uh, I think it was fine in a a decent watch of a movie. Yeah, I agree. Now, next week, we get some Vincent Price in The Mad Magician. Do you remember that one? I, I When I saw the title, I thought, yeah, I know I've seen this, but then I saw a clip yeah. of it, and then nothing rang familiar with me with respect to that. So uh, I, I'm eager to see this one. Prof, how about you? Yeah, I've seen it before, and I remember liking it well enough. Um, it I get it mixed up a little bit with those... Um, Inner Sanctum movies. And I know, obviously, Lon Chaney Jr. is not in it, so it's not one of them. But for some reason, it gives me the vibe of those Inner Sanctum flicks. So I'm looking forward to it. Cool. And, you know, you can't forget that guy. You know the guy that was in that show. He's that guy you know. He's that guy in the show. That guy in the show. Ooh, thanks so much, Prof. It's the time of the show where we talk about this week's That Guy. And this week's That Guy in that show is Michael Pataki. Yeah. Professor, can you please enlighten me and the rest of the listeners about the long, varied career of character actor Michael Pataki, please? You betcha. Michael Pataki was born January 16th, 1938 in Youngstown, Ohio, USA. His family was Hungarian, and he was the youngest of three children and went to USC, where he was in the drama department and played Jerry in the zoo story in Summer Stock. His big early role was in Get Christy Love. I don't know if you remember that one, but um, he plays the goofy sidekick to the first African-American female lead in a, in a TV show, in a, in, particularly in a cop show. Uh, and their relationship was kind of notable in that uh, they rarely talked about race. They were just, he was a goofball, and they were trying to get themselves out of the trouble that they got themselves into. He did a ton of television, and this is very brief amount of just the stuff I recognized. He was in Hawaiian Eye. Uh, he was in the Twilight Zone, a Quality of Mercy episode where he played the Jeep driver. Combat! Exclamation point. My favorite Martian, the Flying Nun, All in the Family, Bonanza, Mission Impossible, Mannix, Batman, McCloud, uh, Star Trek, and Star Trek: The Next Generation, Ren and Stimpy. And he was in Happy Days. He played one of the Malachi brothers. Uh, he was in WKRP in Cincinnati. Batman the Animated Series, where he voiced Sewer King. St. Elsewhere, Cagney and Lacey, Airwolf, Scarecrow and Mr. King. Mrs. King, sorry. They were married, I guess. The Fall Guy, The Jeffersons, Laverne and Shirley, T.J. Hooker. One Day at a Time. He was in Nero Wolf. Oh, I wish I saw that. Charlie's Angels, B.J. and the Bear. 
Little House on the Prairie, Barney Miller, Hardy Droy Boys and NC Drew Mysteries, Beretta, Ellery Queen, The Invisible Man, you know, the one in the 70s, uh, Kung Fu, The FBI, Shaft, and Columbo. Did a bunch of movies, too. He was in Airport 77. He was in the 1977 Spider-Man. Love at First Bite, The Onion Field. Really good movie. Forgotten, but uh, really good. Raise the Titanic. Remo Will Williams, The Adventure Begins and Ended. Uh, Rocky IV, Night Shift classic. The Last Porno Flick, Dracula's Dog, Grave of the Vampire, The Baby. That was weird. Halloween IV, Easy Rider, where he played mime number four, and The Return of Count Yorga. My personal memory of Michael Pataki, of course, was as the Klingon Korax in The Trouble with Tribbles. He was the, kind of the sidekick of the main, uh, uh, the main Klingon and uh, started a fight in the canteen or commissary or whatever uh, on the Enterprise. And uh, he was just great. That whole, the whole cast, that whole episode of uh, Trouble with Tribbles was fantastic. Michael Pataki passed on April 15th. 2010 at the age of 72 in North Hollywood, California. Chris, what are some of your memories of my Michael Pataki? Yeah, this was a great call, I think, for yeah, that, that guy one. because he appeared almost in everything that I watched as a little kid growing up. Mm -hmm. Happy Days, of course, popular, popular show. And he was in that, as you mentioned, uh, it was the Fonzie Loves Pinky three-parter where he played Count Malachi, and he was one half of uh, Twin Brothers that took out Pinky in the Demolition Derby. Oh, my gosh. Oh, you know, no. it, was, it was horrific. You know, those were the beloved episodes. Everybody was talking about the Malachi Brothers and the Malachi Crunch and how, how these uh, two guys were like these heroes on the Demolition Derby circuit. And it was just... It's, I can't explain as a little kid, you know, how much this was in the public consciousness of somebody at, uh, in a single digit age back then, but th th it was there. And it was something that everybody talked about at school the next day. Uh, he popped up in so much stuff and he was always memorable. There was an episode of All in the Family where he played a cop named Sergeant Roselli. And the episode was entitled The Taxi Caper. Uh, Archie is mugged and then he's bribed not to press charges. So when he goes into the police station, the way he's dressed, but Takaki is dressed sort of like a little bit disheveled, uh, facial hair, uh, unshaven, and he's smoking a cigarette and Archie <laughs> mistakes him for, for a crook, but he's actually a detective and Archie goes, oh, you're one of those mod squatters, huh? <laughs> no, no, no. But Same yes, and, and Roselli is just incredulous that Archie's dropping the charges because every time this guy gets picked up it seems like all oh, the charges are always dropped he's he's the son of a somebody who's influential and he's he's just mad about that so Roselli calls Archie's character Mr. Bummer not Bunker and I just I thought that was really hysterical and when Archie gets his wallet back it doesn't have the money that's in it then plus he gets you know a fine so he, he's out more than he was bribed off so that really frustrates Archie and I thought he had, did a good turn in that role there was a movie way back in the day that came out along the same lines that I saw on the CBS Friday Night Horror Movie Circuit and I remember seeing Beware the Blob I remember seeing mm -hmm. Gargoyles and one of those movies Yes, Pataki was in was called The Bat People from 1974. And I wish to gosh that Sven would somehow get the rights to put this out there because this is one that I haven't seen in a very, very long time. And I'm curious to see that movie once again, because I re distinctly remember watching that as a young child. And he played Sergeant Ward in that movie. Prof, as you said, he was in uh, Get Christy Love, where he played Pete Gallagher. Police, yes, actually, yeah, he, I remember that so much. Uh, he was also in Kung Fu, Barney Miller, Alice, all these shows that I watched as a child. Then you, know, uh, you mentioned Batman. He played, I think it was a henchman of King Tut, if I'm not mistaken, mm. in King Tut's second appearance. I could be mistaken. He was also in two Little House of the Prairie episodes. The first episode was called To Run and Hide. Now, doesn't have a lot to do there. His character dies, and his pregnant wife, played by Colin Wilcox, another person who is, we should consider for that guy, blames the town doctor, Doc Baker, for the death. So Doc Baker retires and the replacement doctor, played by Berta Benning, is so indifferent and uncaring that Charles Ingalls, played by Michael Landon, has to convince Doc Baker to help with the pregnant widow's delivery when she wants him to deliver the baby. Pataki also appeared in the episode entitled The Family Tree. In that episode, he played Albert's biological father and 
This guy's also adept at playing Russian characters as well. He played a Russian defector in an episode of WKRP in Cincinnati, and he was the sports administrator for Ivan Drago in Rocky IV. So really memorable roles there and there. And of course, he also was the one who mooned the whole courtroom in the Ron Howard directed Night Shift. So for that, an illustrious <laughs> career indeed for the talented Michael Pataki. Absolutely. So this week's That Guy in That Show is Michael Pataki. He's that guy, you know. He's that guy in the show. That guy in the show. And now it's time to check out our frenzy faves. Not just another comic day. These are our frenzy faves. Today, our frenzy faves is a favorite Twilight Zone episode. Chris, tell us about the episode we're looking at today. Thanks, Prof. Our episode is entitled Third from the Sun. This was from season one. It was episode 14. It was directed by Richard L. Bear, teleplay by Rod Serling, based on Third from the Sun by Richard Matheson. The original air date was January 8th, 1960. For our cast, we have Fritz Weaver as Will Sturka, Edward Andrews as Carling, Joe Maras as Jerry Ryden, Denise Alexander as Jody Sturka, Lori March as Eve Sturka, and we had Gene Evans as Anne Wright. And Prof, can you please tell mm. us and the listeners what happens in the episode Third from the Sun? You betcha. So we see a line of employees trying to gain admittance to a military laboratory. They're building weapons for an all-out war with a very dangerous enemy, and they're building a bomb to destroy everything. One employee, Will Circa, talks with another, Carling, who seems suspicious of Circa for some reason. Carling said that he's heard something terrible will happen in the next 48 hours. Uh-oh. So Circa is very concerned and goes home and talks with his wife Eve and teen daughter Jody about having a couple, Jerry, and his wife Ann over for cards. There's something unspoken between Will and his wife Eve. When Jerry and his wife arrive, they talk about the test aircraft Jerry's been flying. It can fly out into space. When they're alone, Will and Jerry discuss getting their families to the spacecraft and then to take off in space before the nuclear holocaust or whatever it is that's going to happen. And they're going to go this very night. Will gets a call from work telling him he has to come to work and he tells his families they have to go now. But then Carling arrives at the house and everyone is super nervous that their plan will slip out. He has some lemonade and like looks very skulkily at everybody and then finally leaves. The two families take off for the airfield, but when they arrive, Carling is also there. They have to overpower him and make their way to the flying saucer there with the authorities on their trail. They're able to get into the aircraft and take off. They look at the star map and point out the place they are heading. The third planet from this particular star called the Sun, a planet called Earth. Dun, dun, dun. This was a tense episode. Um, it wasn't really a mind blower because I think you could see what was going on, but I liked how it held the tension throughout the episode. It was really, really good. I do have to point out that there was kind of an overuse of Dutch angles, um, but that really lent itself to the general feeling of unease. And I, I think that had that definitely had something to do with it. But it was noticeable and a little distracting at times. The acting was particularly good here, um, particularly Fritz Weaver as Will Sturka and Edward Andrews as Carling. Um, he was, Carling was really creepy and freaky. Um, and, um, definitely Edward Andrews could be a, that guy in that show. He, you know, very recognizable actor for the era. Um, I really thoroughly enjoyed, uh, third from the sun. Chris, what did you think about it? Thanks, Prof. I liked it, too. To get some trivia out of the way, Fritz Weaver also appeared in the Twilight Zone episode that we covered, The Obsolete Man, totally different role, and you could just really him stretch his acting chops from, from that role to this. Yeah. Joe Moross also appeared in the Twilight Zone episode, The Little People, and Edward Andrews also appeared in the Twilight Zone episode, You Drive. Director Richard L. Bear also directed the Twilight Zone classic, To Serve Man. Mm. And for me, he's probably best known for directing the majority, I mean, the majority of all the episodes of Green Acres. Oh. Prop. One thing you said, you know, you can't help but 
see all of these Dutch angles in the house. Mm. And I mean, every place you stand, you wonder if the thing's on a, sl- a tilted yeah. slab because there's just so <laughs> many of these things, no matter where we go. If, if you're in the entryway, if you're on the stairwell, if you're in the basement, I mean, there's so, so many of these tilted slants and you just get the uneasiness and the tension that's used in there. One thing that I have to commend Bear is like when they're playing cards, the, the table is glass. And I haven't seen a glass table in a house maybe since I was a little kid. And I don't know if it's more of a Southern thing or, or more of a fashion house fashion thing in general. But I, it was just so unique where we got a shot from under the glass table when they're playing cards. And I thought that was really, really effectively done. I mean, when have you seen a shot like that? I, I can't yeah. think. But I have to really commend Bear for the direction choices that he has in this episode. It's really, really good. Uh, just some little minor observations daughter jody just seems so overly friendly with everybody she 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 she's really happy to see her dad i mean what teen is really that happy to see her dad and wants to dance when and and with respect to that and when the guy comes over to play cards you know says hey she calls him by his first name and says you know i had to give up a date to you know so you better have some jokes ready i mean there's just some playfulness there that the, the daughter character has that i thought was kind of unique and unusual we get to the scene where they're playing cards and Carlin comes in and the tension is just mm. so palpable. There's one scene when they're, they're, they're panning uh, everybody and they're just giving their bids with their, with how they're playing. And you could just see the tension on their faces and you just can feel it. And you really have to commend each and every actor who's doing that scene and the way it's directed. It, it's mm. really, really effective. Then, then Carlin comes in as Edward Andrews and he's so matter of fact, I mean, th- this is, He's so menacing and he's so devilishly intrusive and I love it just how he pulls that off. And just the way he he, he tries to snatch the paper out of Maras's hand and he's trying to conceal it. And then he says, oh, Mrs. Sturka, you're nervous. You're very nervous. I mean, so you just want to yell at the guy, get get the hell out of my house, you know, but yeah. you have to you have to play it straight and you have to not cause any suspicion but it, it it is so unnerving when he's present and you could just feel that unnerviness there um i liked it there there's a great great scene i remember when i first watched this as the kid where the the group of people arrive at the gate with the car and they signal with the light and the flashlight and you're wondering who's approaching and you think mm. oh gosh i hope it's not edward andrews and it is and it, <laughs> oh, it's all ruined and everything like that but you have to credit uh daughter jody for you know slamming the car now i had a like a false oh, yeah. memory like mandela effect here because when i when i saw this episode i heard a sound effect like it, it like uh carlin got punched in the chin and got mm. knocked out but for me i always remembered it that he got punched in the gut and that was enough to cause him to lose consciousness. And I thought that didn't, it, I didn't buy it as a kid, but when I saw it recently this past week, yeah, he, he, I heard a sound effect distinctly where he got punched in the jaw. So I had a false memory of that episode. So mm-hmm. there we are. One, one weird scene that always makes me laugh unintentionally is when they put the car, they open the gate and the car rushes to the, the saucer object and the, the car has a weird sound. It sounds like it's revved up kind of weird and it's got this machinery kind of sound. And then yeah. you hear this loudspeaker, unauthorized vehicle on the field, unauthorized vehicle on the field, security, request that authorized vehicle to halt. I mean, how polite can you be? I mean, I would think, you know, <laughs> I would think these shoulders, soldiers were going to, the guards were going to shoot the car out, you know, shoot the tires out, shoot the occupants of the car, ask questions later. But I mean, request it to halt, you know, this thing's not going to halt. I, I, I thought that was so kind of comical unintentionally there, but we got the nice uh, bit where we've got the, the little twist inning, a third from the sun. It's a planet called earth. Mm-hmm. Whoa. You know, and, and as a kid, when you see these episodes for the first time with different illusions and not similar retellings of stories with, with the twi- twist innings, what have you, this was a really jaw dropping ending in my opinion. And you just wondered how these people were going to assimilate into Earth society once they got to the planet Earth. And what was this place they got to before? Uh, the only other note I had was in the opening scene was where, like, like all that electrical gear. I wonder where they shot that scene mm. because it, it almost seems like one of these um, power generators that you have with a chain link fence roped around uh, that, that you, not forbidden, but it just, I wondered if, if any of the actors sort of felt vibrations or anything mm. being so close to electricity like that. I always wondered, you know, because that, that, that did not look like a set built just for that. It looked like they they went there to build around it because mm. all of that electrical equipment seemed to be too authentic and too everything like that. So it seems to me they almost 
moved things there. And I just wondered if there was any counter effects with some sort of static electricity charge that any of these characters felt. But that's just a minor note that I had. All in all, I like the episode. A professor like you, superior acting all throughout, top to bottom, soup to nuts. This was a really good, solid, well-acted episode from everybody in the cast. Yeah. And I think there were, you mentioned about the car sounded kind of funny. Um, the phone, when the phone rang, it sounded funny too. It wasn't the regular, you know, earth American. Yes, yes, yes. It was like, boop, 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 boop. Yeah. and you're like, huh, that's weird. And the phone was weird too. For the time, for 1960, yes, yes. it was an odd phone. Indeed. So that was kind of some of the clues that we weren't on earth. Mm-hmm. Um, I and the other you alluded to, and I didn't mention it in my recap, but then I, as you were talking, it just was. So when, um, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Carling comes in, and he's, uh, they've got the plans written down on. Uh, Will has it, the plans, you know, where they're going to go and the the takeoff and everything on a piece of paper, and he turns it over when Carling comes in and writes something on on the other side of the paper. But as he's holding it, and Carling and he see see the one side, the side he's trying to hide is on the bottom and the audience sees it very clearly. And it just really builds the tension. Like, Oh, I hope Carling doesn't see the, you know, the takeoff plans. It really, really worked for me. Yeah, it does. And that was, thank you, prop. That's a good one. And that sparked another memory too, because whenever it's a hot night out, I always think of that the throwaway line there where he says, I like to take a walk on a hot night. It makes me sleep better. And I, uh-huh. whenever that, for whatever reason, that line always stuck with me, you know, and I don't know, I can't put a finger on it as to the how or the why, but it's just one of those things that my brain always stores. And yeah. whenever it's a hot night outside, I think of Edward Andrews, eh, I bet his character's taking a nice walk tonight. And he's going to sleep. <laughs> <with him." laughs> uh, but we're, yeah, we're going to have to put Andrews on the, that guy list. Yeah, well, I hate. I, I wonder if we had already. To be honest, we're going to have to check our archives because I think we might have. But we'll, oh, okay. we'll double check. We'll we'll double check, folks, and we'll get back to you. Because yeah, yeah he did a lot of great stuff, and he was oh. really, really good here. He sure was. So this week's frenzy fave is third from the sun. Well, Prof, you put something on social media last week, and I'm going to let you take the floor, and then I'm going to try to counter you. So why don't you go and you say what you put on social media last week, and then I'll, I'll, I'll try to chime in and match you. All right, we'll try. Hypnosis exposes all of Moses' psychosis, but Moses, he throws us psychotically. For no one's psychosics are cozily exposed as old Moses. it's a show tis of comics TV. Hypnosis exposes all of Moses' psychosis, but Moses, he throws us psychotically. For no one's psychosis are causally exposed as all Moses at the show is of comics TV. Yes, and that all was right. driving my... Well, thanks. And yeah, uh, Singing in the Rain, right? Yep, Singing in yes. the Rain. <laughs> yes, by the talented... <laughs> Uh, Donald O'Connor, if I'm not mistaken, yes. uh, yep. did that. Uh, yeah, really, really, really good stuff. Well done, Prof. I don't oh, know. Where, thanks, did you, you, did you happen to see? It. Did you happen to see Singing in the Rain recently? What what made you think of that? I wonder. No, I just like that movie, I, and uh, I don't like musicals, but I like that movie. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, classic, classic. Yeah, and yeah. Madge Blake uh, from oh. Anne Harriet from uh, Batman is is has a brief scene way in the opening, I think, and I totally oh. forgot about that when I when I most recently saw that. But classic. yeah, classic, classic, classic. Well, we got some comments. We'll start with our friend Mac Rocks at Mac Rocks 56. Hello again. And he gives me a nice shout out. Great short show today. Well, thank you so much. The Twilight Zone episode back there is a classic of time travel for sure. Interesting how we view time as linear slash absolute and one universe setting. It has always presented as such in many movies, books, comics, TV, etc., And then came this, which I still rack my head on, and he gave us a link to YouTube where Dr. Banner is explaining how time travel works. Mm. Fascinating link. What say you? As always, thank you for entertainment and info, and please be well and safe. Well, same to you, Mac Rocks. Please be well and safe. Yeah, really interesting. Prof, have you given any thought to the time travel conundrum and possibly changing things in the past, and then could could it have a ripple effect in the future? Well, I kind of like the uh, the approach the community takes, the show community, where you have multiple different timelines and timelines can split off and stuff like that. Um, 
I don't know. I think uh, it's it's interesting that I, I read somewhere that everybody think is afraid of going back in time and changing the future, but nobody thinks that they have any effect over the future in their regular life. So that's kind of a conundrum. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just, um, in terms of things, events happening, I think that um, we are all hung up on things that happen um, as humans and um it doesn't really matter much so if we could go back in time and change things who cares i mean the world doesn't care um things could be drastically better or worse and um the world the sun just keeps coming up it doesn't make any difference it's just people stuff how about you what do you think i i i have always mixed thoughts about it i always think there is a why why can't it change if you do something in the past why wouldn't it affect the future i mm -hmm. i just can't see i can't wrap my hand around otherwise but then i read fiction where i'm proven wrong or somebody else posits a different theory by weird coincidence when mac rocks posted this of all things i happened to reread a comic book it was marvel two and one number 50 and i'll try to give i'll try i'm Tangent, <laughs> tangent alert, but here I go. <laughs> now, in this issue, Reed Richards is trying to cure the thing of his Rocky persona, and, mm -hmm. and he's done it in a sense that he's created a formula, but the thing says, hey, okay, you created a formula, give it to me. And Reed says, no, it won't work, because this would have worked back when you originally changed into your, the thing, and when you sort of had a more uh, clayish more morphous appearance. Mm. If I had given you the formula day one, it would have worked. But in all the years that have passed, you've sort of gone more comfortable in your appearance. You've sort of changed and evolved in your appearance. This formula is useless to you now. So Ben decides to take a time platform, go back in the past. And of course, it's a Marvel comic book. So they got to fight because the, the thing in the past doesn't believe the thing in the future. He thinks he's some some no good nick up to bad, you know, sinister purposes. So they have to have a battle. Well, the the the, the thing from the present knocks out the thing from the past. He gives him the formula. Ben Grimm awakens to find that he's in human form. So the thing takes the time platform. He'll go back to his present time and he'll think that he's been changed back to a human. So he comes back and he says, hey, Reed, look at me. You know, I'm I'm. What do you think? And and Ben and Reed says, "What are you talking about?" So Ben looks in a mirror, he sees his reflection, he goes, "I'm still the same. I don't get it." And Reed says, "Well, of course, this you, 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 when you change the past, that past is always going to stay the past forever. Mm -hmm. All you did was create a separate timeline when you gave yourself the original formula to change you back to a human. All you did was alter a course and and created a different reality. The reality that you have is always going to be that reality, and the past that you always had is always going to stay in the past, and that cannot be changed." And I go. Read you son of a bitch because <laughs> you, you you kind of ruined my 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 thought and idea that you know you, there could be a ripple there could be the, the, like a butterfly effect where you you can change but according to this particular issue of Marvel Comics no and I, I find it always interesting fodder for entertainment and it always always left me curious and I, I I'm always baffled by the conundrum so that that's that's my present answer right now yeah, that's a good one yeah. <laughs> Continuing right. on, we also heard from our buddy Randy. Yes. <laughs> Over in Soundtrack Alley. Randy said, hypnosis, exposes, comics, explosions. No Moses, psychosis, but endeavors to be. When the exposure comes, the guy who no is, then you compose the rest. If you need to expose the comics explosions to join us, the most of the show, the professor knows it. <sighs> Randy, my gosh, <laughs> look at you. Amazing. Brilliant, brilliant and amazing stuff. And he concludes with he shows it listen randy thank you very very much for your amazing amazing positive there i cannot match your talent with how you did that <laughs> then over at randy landers one rapid fire wednesday comics give us quick and easy fixes who's that guy in the corner and fun times with a villain in the comics bring it home with a favorite it's the professor friendly oh. show thank you so much now, I like the path that Clinton took yeah. over at Coffee Comics, BLG. Clinton now. And he it. says, yeah, he says, hey, I can't be as great as the, as the prop this week, so I'm just going to give you a retweet. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, t tell me about it, Clinton, because I it is so hard. You know, I, I, I had to come up with a poem, and boy, that took me quite a while. Let's say, you know, I, I did a little uh, side project uh, somebody on the show knows about, but uh, yeah, it, it, it is it is difficult. It is difficult. We also heard from a friend, Catcher Chick Cat Victory. Check out this week's prof show with myself and the professor. This week, time travel, if you want to discuss it in person or 
in a group of us are meeting here last Thursday. Ah, see what he did there? <laughs> nice. Nicely cat. done. Nicely oh, done. So funny. So fun. So with that, we'll roll on to our likes and retweets and shout outs. We'll start off with the mascot of the show, Robin at Robin 031 Robin. Thank you so much. Uh, here at the Professor Frenzy Show, we hope uh, a rough week this past week. We hope everything is going well when you're hearing this recording. We heard from our friend Two Sleeps at Two Sleeps Music. Two Sleeps puts on a musical concert for free. How, you may ask yourself, can you get involved with it? Well, it's on Sunday afternoons, 3.30 Eastern, 2.30 Central. What you need to do is go into your computer, type in the search bar, Two Sleeps Music, Twitch TV. Then you'll get the link. Then you'll get a prompt to sign up for an interactive chat. And once you're there, you can interact with the rest of the audience on a live feed. And you'll be subjected to some poll questions. You'll have a great time. It'll be a nice, fun experience. I guarantee it. What is going to be played? You never know. But you might hear some Roger Miller, King of the Road. You might hear some Commander Cody. You might hear some Eagles. You might hear some Queen. You might hear some Beatles. You might hear some Monkeys. You might hear some Johnny Cash. It's a wide catalog of stuff, and I am down for it. You will be too. Trust me, because it puts a smile on my face, and I will put a smile on your face as well. It's a great way to start off the week. Please check it out. Also, not to be outdone, he puts on a fantastic Patreon. Most recently, some old classic rock and roll stuff that I really, really dug and enjoyed. So thank you, Two Sleeps. We appreciate it. Patreon, please check out the Patreon, because for a mere price of a dollar, you will be treated to some great original content. We heard from the Geek Collective at underscore Geek Collective. Thank you so much. Check out the services that Joy performs. And if you're into comics, this guy's on the pulse of the great indie stuff at Joey Galvez 1984. It's a podcast that Randy does called Soundtrack Alley. It's on social media at Soundtrack Alley. That's where Randy looks to see how a song or music itself enhances the film. Also, a little bit of film history, one of the more better produced podcasts out there. Please check it out. Randy, you can find his talented artwork at Randall Andrews 1. We heard from our buddy David A. Quinley at yeah, David A. Quinley 21. Yeah. Thank you so much. Awesome. Again, the aforementioned Joey Galvez at Joey Galvez 1984 at Geek Collective. Thank you so much. We really, really appreciate that. Doc Strange at Billy D underscore Licious. Now, he also has an alternate account, World on Fire All Star Squad and Podcast. But this guy had a massive week because. He did Bronze Age of Horror Comics, where he looked at Werewolf by Night with his buddy mm-hmm. Al, as per usual. Then it was The Brave and the Bob, where he looks at a Bob Haney-written comic book by the zany Bob Haney. This had the guest Professor Allen himself looking mm-hmm. at an issue of World's Finest 239, a book that I distinctly remember having getting off of a spinner rack. Thank you so much. Great times there. And another book that I remember getting off a of spinner rack. Rom number one, and this is a podcast that he did with Ed, where they're going to do a deep dive in all the issues of Rom. Yeah, I remember Rom the toy, believe it or not, gang. I remember it, but at age 12, I, it was so hard for me because I was sort of outgrowing like the action figure stuff. 12 is kind of a weird age, and that, that I was sort of pressed beyond that. But I do remember the red LED eyes, and I remember seeing this distinctly. As a toy, and I thought, wow, maybe I should buy the toy, but there, do I leave it in the box? Do I play with it? I don't know, but I was all down for the comic, and I had a complete run, and I remember getting those off the rack. Thank you so much, Ed and Billy D, for doing those fantastic episodes. Really, really loving it. And let's see. We have also have Greg Litchfield at Greg Litchfield. Greg has been a comic book reader and collector for 50 years plus. Holy cow. Wow. Reviews comics on a concise scale from one to five. Another fantastic week. Thank you, Greg, for all of your awesome reviews. If you're into comics, check out at Greg Litchfield. Clinton, my friend, you do a podcast called Com- Coffee and Comics, and you are on social media at Coffee Comics BLG. In the aforementioned podcast, you look at a comic in about the time it takes to down a cup of coffee. Occasionally, you'll have on a guest and ask some fascinating questions. Also do the Days of High Adventure podcast with Sword and Sorcery Comics, Fan Film Fridays, which you can find over at the Longbox Crusade feed. Once you're there, a whole plethora of great podcasts from the Longbox Crusade Crusaders and the whole gang. Please check them all out, each and every one. Mascot of the show, Robin at Robin 031 Robin. Another shout out for you. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. And Mac Rocks at Mac Rocks 56. And then the aforementioned Professor Allen is over at the Relatively Geeky podcast. You can find him on social media at relatively underscore geek. Another fantastic week of podcasts, my friend. Eyes and Ears just recently dropped. 
loving all the material that you're putting out there. Please check it out. Not limited to that, but including the Shortbox Showcase, Tour, Quarter Bin Podcast, and of course, Doom Speak. Over on Threads, we heard from Ad Shelley Comics. Over on Blue Sky, we heard from our buddy Ed at Teal Productions. Once again, shout out to you and Terry. Looking forward to the stuff that you have over New Super Commando, in particular, the Wonder Woman Secret Spy era of the depowered Wonder Woman in the late 60s, early 1970s books I have, along with Terry in the collection. I am reading along. Thanks so much. We also heard from Paralani, and we also heard R.T. Wilson and our buddy Clinton once again over on Facebook. If I overlooked you, my sincerest and deepest apologies. Please let me know on Twitter at BTO and Bapics, or better still, let the professor himself know on all the social media outlets at Professor Frenzy. We'll be sure to mention you on our next show. Show, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Professor Frenzy Show. You can find our podcast if you do an iTunes search for the Professor Frenzy Show. You can listen to the show on Twitter and find me on Twitter at Professor Frenzy and Chris at BTO and Bat Books. Hey, we're on Facebook over the Professor Frenzy Show page. We're on Instagram at Professor Frenzy. We're now also on Amazon Music, and we are now also on YouTube. Just visit youtube.com slash Professor Frenzy, all one word. We are now also on TikTok, so go to Professor Frenzy 2 to see our videos. If you have an Android phone, the Professor Frenzy show is part of the free network. Just swipe right on your homepage and look in the art section of the podcast list. Whatever device you use, you can subscribe to our podcast feed by doing an iTunes search for Professor Frenzy. Thank you for listening to the Professor Frenzy Show. Let us know on Twitter what you think about our show, and please help us get the word out to people that might like these kinds of comics. Thanks to everyone for listening. We look forward to chatting more about comics next week. And please remember, pick up your poll. Professor Frenzy. Professor Frenzy. All original content of The Professor Frenzy Show is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution, No Derivatives 3.0, Unported License. Professor Frenzy. You are on The Frenzy Feed.